I should also add that you are seeing, you are going to hear and see a, a summary of this entire episode. The entire episode I captured in uh, my book, as you see there, 260 pages of it, of which we're going to just summarize what uh, the exciting parts of it, so to speak. So uh, I will start by saying only one man ever successfully escaped after being captured and held by a formal, keyword formal, Chinese Communist Army during what we remember as the warlord era up through the first half century of uh, the 1900s. Before his death in 1981, my father Howard told what he called the Red Story over a hundred times to churches, to mission groups, to conferences, before civic centers, uh, during our furlough in California and the U.S. between 1937 and 1940. He could highlight a few episodes, a couple of which I will share with you, in what we call a 30 thrill a minute uh, meeting at a civic club, or he could stretch this whole story out to three hours in a uh, missions conference or a Christian retreat. I'm going to condense this episode in my extended family's 96 year history in China in a few minutes, and if we have time, we'll have some questions and hopefully answers afterwards. In the early 1890s, two native Swedes, once a naturalized American citizen, my grandfather, Martin Eckfall, and a Swedish national, Emma Eck, met as single missionaries in far western China. They married, and they're really much more cheerful than that picture shows, <laughs> but that was typical of those vintage shots then. Their first of five children born in China was my mother, Gertrude, in 1902. Two of the children died young of disease. The only son was robbed and murdered by rogue warlord troops in 1932, and two daughters, including my mom, married future missionaries to China. Time prevents me from describing the exciting life of my missionary cousin, Robert Eckfall, and you can see Bob's picture on the downstairs uh, going into the wellness center, that oil painting. Uh, Bob was a missionary also of the Christian Missionary Alliance. And uh, at one time, the famous explorer Lowell Thomas called Bob the greatest living authority on Tibet, where he served. My mom, as I mentioned, Gertrude, graduated from Shanghai American School and Wheaton College and then felt called to follow her foot parents' footsteps. As required then of missionary candidates by the Alliance, she took further Bible study at their missionary training institute in Nyack, New York, which incidentally just moved as a college back into New York City where it once was located. There she met a student, Howard Smith, from Washington, Pennsylvania. They married, and after an internship, of a year in New Jersey, ready themselves to sail to China. You see here the map of China, and that is a vintage map. It's the same map that my father used between 1937 and 40 on his deputation trip. What you see in red there is roughly the area in which this capture and escape episode took place. The Yangtze River is shown in red. Chongqing, the future wartime capital of China, is about in that position. Peng Shui is up in the corner of that map. <clears throat> it's remarkable that that map has survived as long as it has, frankly. By 1931, at ages 29 and 27, they had joined her parents in China, typical photograph that missionaries carried and gave away for their remembrance by others in prayer. In Wuchang, Hopei province, a typical 
street scene in uh, probably Hankow across the Yangtze River, but Wuchang was very similar, a scene familiar to our China hands. That city, Wuchang, was in Hopei province, which today is part of the metropolis of Wuhan, better known for its uh, COVID-19 infamy. Uh, the folks completed language study with their tutor. My dad uh, was a basic uh, student, and my mother was refreshing her girlhood uh, knowledge of Chinese. And my dad practices <laughs> technique with chopsticks. You can see that the old timers finds that very humorous. They say that you're only an expert if you can pick a pea up with your chopsticks. Like most missionaries, my dad was a inveterate photographer. Uh, he actually was professional quality, as uh, those who have seen his collection, which I now have, and he's uh, having a fun taking a picture. Now, not many of the male missionaries w rode in sedan chairs often, uh, but in this case, apparently, uh, he was heading off into the hinterlands. <clears throat> The next step for the Smiths was to uh, get ready to go upriver. Dad and mom, that would be Grace, uh, my mother's sister. She was also a Wheaton grad and a school teacher in China. Uh, well along in their years now, my grandparents and their first grandson. So, uh, in our September of 33, we headed up river, and that would be a typical river craft, uh, sizable for carrying a number of people and supplies. You can see how rough the Yangtze was, and in certain places still is. Pulled by coolies, uh, where the river was too fearsome to navigate upstream, it was incredible. This type of work was done for centuries for what we would consider pennies. The strange thing about this is, is that I don't know how that guy got into the picture. He wanted to demonstrate the, the process, and I can assure you that Howard did not stay there long. <laughs> uh, He'd much, much rather ride, as would any of us in those circumstances. Peng Shui, a county seat in Sichuan, about 100 miles as a crow would fly from Chongqing. And it's a tribute on the tributary of the Wu River, uh, almost as fierce at times as the Yangtze. And you can only get there by uh, either footmobile or by boat of some kind. It sits, the town sits on this peninsula with other spur rivers on either side of it. Probably about 3,000 souls. No telephone, no telegraph even. You did have postal service, but it was slow. Kind of like we get here at Windsor. Remember now, this was a turbulent period in modern Chinese history. Chiang Kai-shek was attempting to consolidate the power of the nationalists, either subduing or partnering with the rival provincial warlords all over the country, and at the same time, fighting the widely separated communist armies and bands of different sizes all over the rural area. At the time, there were roughly 8,000 Western missionaries scattered throughout the country, welcomed by many, despised by the atheistic Reds, and viewed xenographically by some as simply foreign devils. All this despite the good works they were doing, building hospitals, schools, forming charities, in addition to evangelizing and church planting. Another view of Peng Shui from atop the ridge down which the Reds descended soon, that would be the, what we would call the mayor's big house. I think the mission compound would be somewhere in there. Uh, 
very much a Buddhist place with uh, posters on the wall to keep out the ear, evil spirits. The typical temple. And uh, although this is not a picture uh, that survived the capture, it shows a typical, in this case, a missionary pastor, not a missionary, a Christian pastor, local, uh, itinerary throughout the countryside with the gospel message. Most of those men would be curious and hopefully some would take away the message that he is leaving, probably disturbing tracks as well. That's the general background of the episode that we're gonna talk about now. Marauding red bands, mischaracterized by the press as mere bandits, uh, prevailed outside the urban areas of China, Shanghai, Chongqing, Guangzhou, Wuhu, the big cities were pretty much in the countryside. They had sway, if you will. My folks in Peng Shui heard rumors in that May of 1934 that uh, a band of uh, unknown size communists were maybe 50 miles away. That seemed pretty safe to them at that time. But there was no more warning on the morning of May 8, 1934, when uh, an army of between four and 5,000 reds swept down over that precipice that we showed a minute ago and without a battle took over the town of Peng Shui. What had happened was that the garrison that was uh, under the command of uh, officers of the local warlord who were partnering, so-called friends of the nationalists, they took off the night before with the city fathers. They had been warned that uh, the army was heading their way, but they didn't alert any of the citizens of the town, nor especially the missionaries. So the first uh, notice that my folks had was pounding on their compound door. Uh, and uh, Dad uh, went down to the door and peeked through the cracks as he tells his story and hoped that they were mere looting real bandits. But seeing the men wearing red bands around their head and armbands in red, he knew this was the worst. They were commies and escape at that point was hopeless. A squad of eight led by a corporal poured into the mission compound absolutely amazed at finding white people. Not often were the missionaries trapped cold, so to speak. They usually had a chance at least to, to either hide or get away. And they immediately began looting the two-story mission house. Shortly thereafter, the commanding general had been told that they had apprehended uh, white people. Uh, Ho Long appeared looked them over, according to dad, didn't say a word to them, gave some orders to his aides to station a guard and disappeared for the day. The following morning, Ho dictated to the terms of the ransom for, for uh, the release of Howard. Uh, and then uh, another officer said uh, uh, <clears throat> he was going to release Gertrude and their son to take the ransom note to civilization or to downriver. And he said quite matter-of-factly that uh, they could, uh, she could take only what she could carry, which included, they were grateful, some canned milk for their 21-month-old son. He also, Ho also warned her that uh, if she gave away the, the uh, identity of the sp soldier that she was going to take with him as an escort, if she gave away the, his identity, they would immediately execute her husband. <clears throat> I should preface or interrupt here to point out that uh, 
I was born on the top of Lushan Mountain, which was a very scenic spot in China. And the only way to get up that mountain, as you can see, unless you walked, and the men and boys liked to walk. It was 4,000 feet up there, so it was no uh, walk in the park. You would negotiate the rate you were willing to pay the, the sedan chair uh, attendants to get up there. My mother generally rode, as would uh, most of the ladies. I don't know any ladies that walked up there, but nonetheless, some probably did. And the path would be, I'm going to guess, at least 100 years old, because the mountain, uh, summer mountains, protected Westerners and missionaries in the summertime. They flocked to the higher altitudes because the Yangtze Basin was known for disease uh, during these hot summer muggy months. You'll be interested that the hospital in which I and Dick Geezer, those of you that frequent the medical eye clinic, he and I were born in the hospital right there. Only it took us 40 <coughs> years to figure that out because we were born five years apart. Uh, John Kai Shek would come there in the summer times and he would stay probably in that particular villa. We were, in our two summers there, 31 and 32, we were within 50 yards of him and we would often see Madame John Kai Shek coming down into the village there. She attended the Protestant church on a regular basis. Most of you will remember that she was a uh, what we would consider a born-again Christian <clears throat> and very friendly to the residents and summer missionaries that came to Gulen. Well, with that interlude, we'll go back to uh, uh, Peng Shui, where Gertrude was handed this handwritten ransom note for the release of her husband. You won't believe the amount of money in U.S. dollars that they expected or demanded for a release, this was in the midst of the worldwide depression and uh, of a mission organization. They wanted 50,000 American dollars and $3,200 in medicine. Well, both she and dad knew immediately that there was no chance that uh, any ransom was going to be paid by the organization, and there was no one they knew that had that kind of, of uh, resources anyway. So my mother's trip down river with that is almost as exciting as my father's in terms of perilous occasions. She dictated that fortunately for us. I don't have time to tell her story, but uh, she was a gritty gal. It took two days to get with a boat and a number of people on it down to Fuzhou, which was at the junction of the Wu and Yangtze rivers. There was a mission station there, and they cared for her for a number of days. And then she went down to Wuchang, where her parents were ministering. And that took about another two weeks to get down there. But uh, she made it. Incidentally, she was pregnant. And my uh, sister was born in Wuhu a few months later. That is. Literally, I think, the boat they were on. She's positioned there, and the Chinese young man, who actually was on a mission, a spying mission for the Reds. That's why they warned Gertrude that uh, she was not to reveal his identity. And he, he survived, at least as far as Hankow, where he disappeared one night, and the authorities were very upset that they didn't have a chance to interrogate him. The captain of the boat, I think, is this guy here. On the way to Fuzhou, that is a typical China village alongside the river. It's quite impressive, wasn't it? I'm sure that's why my dad took that picture on the way up, but she passed it on the way down. When she got to civilization, I call it civilization, the, and I share, share this letter because it's interesting. Uh, <clears throat> this is authored by the captain of one of our 
uh, gunboats, the gunboats. And uh, he invited, asked if he could uh, meet my mom and uh, greet her after he, she got to Hankow. The Americans and missionaries and Westerners in general were always very welcome on the gunboats, be they British or American or French or German. And uh, Calhoun was very cordial, Terry Hoon. So where are we now in the story? Gertrude stood on the edge of the banks of the Wu, -Hu -Wu River and watched her husband in the middle of this long passage of captives that were being taken from the village from the, for ransom and the army as it was ferried across the river and up the trail. I think she got away from him but did not have a chance to talk to him at all after he was uh, separated from her. And she was praying, obviously, as she said, for a miracle, because as I mentioned, there was really no chance for a ransom. As to, you might ask in your question, how many of these who were captured, it was a common way for the communists to raise money by ransom, not only from the few they were fortunate enough to capture from the West, but the Chinese that have wealth whom they picked up along the way. Of the Chinese that were held for ransom, probably half ended up being executed after they, were after they were drained of whatever resources their families had or were willing to send them. As for the Westerners, over the years, pick a number. Maybe there were 30 to 40 that were captured over that period of time. Uh, I heard of 18 being executed for one reason or another. The rest, uh, some were released because they were too ill to go on the march, uh, and uh, whoever commanded the army at the time or their leader was uh, sympathetic enough to let them go back to their, their position, their families. Uh, <clears throat> others were ransomed, either by individual families or in some cases, organizations, companies, like the oil companies that could pay ransom. And as I mentioned, there were some that were executed, usually beheaded. Well, <clears throat> it was up now to the, our State Department, or the Nanking Nationalist Authorities, or the, the Sichuan warlord that you see there. He was nominally an ally of the nationalists, but pretty well run, ran his own operation. It was quite a ways from Nanking, where our uh, nationalists were headquartered. But he was uh, nominally promised that he would do all he could to get uh, Reverend Smith released. And of course, we were most concerned that uh, the Lord would find a way to get him out. This incident, incidentally, at the time made most of the major newspapers in the US, such as uh, this one here that featured the capture. That was newsworthy at the time. And uh, then you have a paper in New Jersey showing Ho when he was one of the commanders for the warlords in Hupei. This was before he joined the Communist Party. <laughs> Quite a, uh, an elaborate gear. When I showed this, literally showed this to his widow in 1980, she chuckled, she laughed. I don't think she'd ever seen this picture, so I had it enlarged and presented it to her on another trip. But uh, it was quite a story in its tie, including in our Chicago Tribune, for which I have a clipping. Uh, once, it, uh, once he disappeared into the hinterlands, the media heard very little if anything, at least our US media, for about two months when he was surfaced alive. I want to tell you a little about Holan. Uh, at the time, he was 37 years old and uh, quite a dashing figure. He was born in Hunan in the 1890s. He was pretty much of a rebel from the age of 19 on, but an intelligent 
guy with leadership skills, came out of what they would consider a middle class. His father was a merchant, not something he was proud of. And uh, after he became uh, an early adult, he formed bands of up to several thousand men, affiliating him with that warlord that I displayed earlier. And he finally joined the party in 1927, became, rose up through the ranks pretty fast to become a, literally a general by 1934. Ho survived the long march. He survived the Sino-Japanese War, and he uh, survived the Chinese Civil War to the point where he was a colleague and confidant of Mao Zedong, as you can see on the left. This probably was taken in the 1950s and then promoted to be one of the six high-ranking marshals, our equivalent to a four-star general in the Red Army. Ho is number two there. I would suspect that most of those whom I have not identified but could were purged during the Cultural Revolution, as was Ho, incidentally. Uh, he, <clears throat> unfortunately for him, by the time of 1966, he had gotten on the hit list, if you will, of Ho's wife, Jing Zhang. She was of the famous Gang of Four. In fact, she was the leader of the Gang of Four. And she influenced Mao uh, not to protect his old comrade, which happened to many of the uh, cadre who were uh, martyred or otherwise died during that terrible period. He had diabetes, Ho did, and when he was put under hospital arrest, the Red Guards, the young Red Guards, took away his insulin, and he slowly died away. It wasn't until the mid-1970s that, like tens of thousands of others, it was acknowledged that he was a victim and uh, did not deserve his fate. And so he was re rehabilitated as a good guy, if you will. My take on Ho, as I've studied him, that he was tough, very outgoing and charming when he wanted to be, uh, sometimes cruel, but not an evil man at, by the standards of those times. He's credited in China for being the father of their Olympic movement. A postscript. In 1980, when I was head of a US telecom delegation invited by the People's Republic to put on workshops in China. I had 40 te technical people with me. Uh, somehow the Beijing media, whom I still to this day don't know who outed me, as they say, that I had uh, ties with the whole family, uh, albeit <clears throat> not knowing it at the time, they had me interview Madam Xu Ming, the widow of Ho. That's a picture of Ho with Xu when they were still probably out in Hunan during the uh, 1940s. Uh, this is a map of China showing, parts of China showing the area where we were occupied, Peng Shui. Uh, you'll hear about this town, that's where we ran not we, my dad ran into a group of uh, bad guys, and uh, generally the terrain in which we operated. That's the incident I was just talking about where I interviewed, we dialogue literally rather than interviewed uh, with an interpreter there to translate for us. And uh, you can see that she's, she's pretty animated. Basically a nice lady, animated, uh, as we talked about it. The irony of all this is that the media played up that entire capture, ransom, escape incident as a walk in the park. We were good friends, don't be worried, nothing was gonna happen to this guy. And being a guest of the government, I had to accept this politically correct version of it. But uh, you don't believe that. It was pretty serious stuff at the time. Uh, two years after this 
incident, I was back in China with another delegation, same thing, putting on workshops on telecommunications. And while our group was being toured at the Great Wall, where I had already been, uh, I was invited to her villa, which was a very nice, by Chinese standards, walled estate on the outskirts of Chongqing, uh, sorry, Beijing, and we had our formal picture taken with uh, three of her four children. Her son was a colonel in the Air Force, and boy, if you look at these two pictures, you can see that he was a spitting image at about age 37 of his father. Uh, two years after that, I ended up back in China again doing the same thing. Uh, and that lady came out to the Holiday Inn where we were being housed at the time, and she brought with her a biography that had been written by one of Ho's officers and they had taken the time to translate it into English, filled it with pictures, and she wanted me, actually her mother, wanted me to bring that back to the US and plead with publishers to print it. If it had been a true biography of Ho, it would have been fascinating, but it was, as you might expect, sanitized. And uh, there's no way that the, a publisher would touch it. I still have it. It's quite an artifact. Well, we're gonna go back to the captivity. During the 52 days he marched with this army, Howard figured he hiked be 800 to 1,000 miles, zigzagging over rugged terrain in thinly populated Sichuan and Guizhou. Again, a rough idea of where they were at. Someone did this for me, that's Peng Shui, and they roamed this territory and more. This was be, have been a mission station uh, where an alliance had a, an outpost manned by a missionary and he always kind of in his mind wanted to position, find out where he was in relationship to Lung Town and hope that he could escape and get to that. Uh, this is the outpost, which he finally got to, as I'll mention later in the incident, you can see its relationship to Peng Shui, not that far away, but all by boat to get there. Daily marches um, averaged about 20 miles. And he says the longest march that he re could remember in a single day was 40 miles. He was 30 years old, six foot two inches tall, and 185 very fit pounds. Ho's contingent had no pitched battles, since there was no government troops in the force in the area to fight. They were there to propagandize the uh, locals. They recruited and they trained new troops. And that's the kind of terrain that we dealt with at the time. Those mountains were huge. I'm not saying that they were climbed by the armies or even by Howard to that length, but they did a lot of uh, up and downs and uh, invested these villages from time to time to rest up. He says that he looked for ways to escape every single day he was out there. But the captives were kept in the middle, as you would expect, of the march under tight guard at nights uh, in the bivouacs that they had. He did witness executions. Some of them were uh, ransomed uh, prisoners that either didn't pay, didn't pay up, their families didn't pay up, or they had drained their families of all the resources that they had left. But he wasn't personally maltreated for obvious reasons. He was a very valuable product. So uh, they uh, treated him as well as they treated anybody else. Although anything of value was taken from him, he was allowed to keep his pocket devotional, quite exceptional, it's called broken bread. I still have it somewhere. We looked for it earlier today, but couldn't find it. And he made notations in that, the daily notations of how many li, li a Chinese 
third of a mile, how many Lee they had gone that day and where they had bivouacked. So that gave me resources to put together uh, an account in the book here. So he kept that in, in a place of a Bible. He had something of encouragement. <clears throat> One of the notations for June 6th, 1934, says this, eight with general. Ho liked to have long candlelight conversations with his Western captive, in Chinese, of course, and play Shang-Chi. Some of you might know it's the Chinese word for elephant chess. And by golly, it is a very like checkers. I learned how to play it. It's a cross between checkers and chess, very popular in China. You can buy it at some of these downtown Chinatown shops. And the guards would bring Howard up to Ho's tent for a game. In later years, he often told us in his talks, he would chuckle when he told how audiences, how told his audiences that this reminded him of an old Chinese proverb. Quote, a peasant was brought in to play with the emperor mm. to avoid having his head cut off. He had to play well enough to satisfy the emperor, but never to win. Uh, Ho also loved to show off his fountain pen, which was filled symbolically with red ink. And yes, Howard witnessed to his captors and often talked theology of sorts with the more receptive. Along the way, he saw a lot of these poppy fields, opium being picked. Of course, the Reds pretty much banned opium when they had uh, have banned opium during their regime and rule. But uh, in that era, there was a lot of, of uh, opium uh, agriculture in the rural areas. Just like medieval times, civilians who posed no threat, remember the old camp followers, posed no threat, came and went into the camp. He was quite amazed when one day the Smith's mission station cook boy named Yang Sipu showed up to voluntarily become a helper and aid and accompany Howard. He was very really taken by that, this young 22-year-old boy. We call him a boy. He even, Yang Sipu even took two letters, two letters, which I have, the original written from captivity, took these out, posted them to my mother, uh, which again is quite remarkable that not only that, but they survived. These two are dated, one of them is dated eight days before he escaped, and the other only three days before he escaped. One of them, as it says in there, he was told that he had to write not to delay payment. And that clued Howard that realistically his time was running out because the Reds tolerated no extra mouths to feed. Come that day of June 26, or let's see, one's dated June 30 and the other a little later. But anyway, on the morning of June 26, for the first time, he and Yang were housed in a barracks on the outskirts of this encampment. You can imagine 4,000 men encamped. It was a huge encampment in a valley. It would take me literally another half hour to describe in what he does in several pages how he got away that morning at daybreak when he figured, as he told me, that he figured he'd need a half an hour of uh, a head start to be able to, uh, to elude the pursuit that was going to be inevitable. Eight minutes after he and Yang were climbing the nearby hillside through the brush, at about 5.30 in the morning, the Reveille bugles all over the valley went off and signaled that within seconds, it would be known that their prime captive was gone. And this is my thought. You can bet that the six men that were housed in the cabin with him, including a full colonel, and especially the guard outside the door who had fallen asleep and allowed them to slip out, were dealt with harshly. I have to feel sorry for them having served in the military. There's a little humor now and then in all of this episode. Listen to Howard, I'm gonna quote him. I was running with my sandals in my teeth 
after they'd fallen off. It was very strenuous uphill, and I got out of breath. I called ahead to the boy. Wait a minute, I've got to stop and rest. He simply said, no, we've got to keep on going, and began to disappear. I managed to stagger on, and after a while, got my second wind, and turned around a bend in the trail, and almost <laughs> ran into him. He was so out of breath, he was heaving, and said, let's hide for a little while and see what they're going to do. I said, what? We've got to keep on going. And I took <laughs> off and let him follow me. That almost brought a laugh out of the crowd. That night, they hid in a cave at the top of the mountain. They later learned that the pursuit had gone all the way to the Wu River and set up a blockade at the Lightly Crossing. Next morning, the two carefully descended the other side of the crest and crossed a valley and came upon a farmhouse after they had been 36 hours now without food. So let's buy some food. With what? We'll never sell a Pennsylvania farm boy short. When the Reds first searched Howard, he quickly beat them to his pocket and pulled out and held up a copper penny, virtually worthless. The guards waved it off. What they didn't know, that behind the copper penny was a silver dollar, called a 1920 big boy, with the image of Yan Shai Kai, the first president of the New Republic. Incidentally, you can buy one like this on eBay for $900. What did it buy? What do you think? How about nine raw eggs? It was a seller's market. P.S. Everything he ate for the rest of his life had to be well done. <laughs> He'd turn green at anything runny, and I was a witness to that. Well, day three, they had avoided that blockade on the Wu and crossed the river. The towel Howard had been wearing as a turban now held precious raw peas they had picked up somewhere, and they were hoarding, hoarding for food. Howard got a touch of sunstroke and fever in the blazing July heat. He urged Wong to go on ahead without him because he was struggling. The boy refused to leave. Nightfall, and they approached a village. Without a word, they opened the door of a house on the outskirts and asked the old farmer and his small family for some food. Nope, but they could sleep for the night on boards that formed a crude sawhorse bed. This was very wild country. About 3 a.m., Howard's fever had broken, and he woke to the smell of dust. Men outside were pounding on the wooden wall. Sa, sa, kill, kill, working themselves into a frenzy. I knew, says Howard, these weren't communists. These were members of a secret society with rights known as spirit or God soldiers. They hated all military, all foreigners, and strangers. They feel impervious to bullets. I believe, he said, they're demon-possessed, and we had been spotted. Some were splintering the locked wooden door with big knives. Others were hammering again outside on the wall. It was pitch black inside the house, and Howard pulled himself up onto the beams across the upper level of the house where the farmer stored his grain. He began to step from rafter to rafter towards the back of the house. The front door broke, and yelling men poured in. The farmer's Families screamed as they were driven outside. A shot ran out as a bullet went up through the roof. Howard could see out the back window a burly guard swinging his sword back and forth, supposedly guarding the back way, yelling like all the rest. A moment later, you could tell this guy was missing the action. He didn't want to be left out. So he left his post and ran around the corner of the house and disappeared. I knew, says Howard, such a chance was all I was, could hope for, and got ready to jump out the window, right in front of another man, <laughs> who yelled, Sa, kill, right in my ear. I jumped out and yelled, Sa, right back at him. 
and ran around the house before he could move. There were fields of corn, cheek high, into which I dropped to my feet. Uh, wrong slide. Uh, you can kill that. No. And began crawling as fast as I could. I almost stopped when I heard the voice of the boy crying, Musha, don't kill. For some reason, they didn't connect him with me. And he actually survived unhurt, as we were to meet sometime later. But I lost my sandals, and my bare feet began to be cut badly as I stumbled away on the rocks. I should mention that Howard was apprehended on the days on the run by five different hostile groups. The remarkable fact was that with his black hair, brown eyes, ragged clothes, and general dishevelment, they thought he was a strange-looking Chinese. <laughs> nor was he ever identified as escaping from the Red Army. And providentially, he also never encountered the same group twice. Going on, the next evening after a grueling day, and I'm gonna condense the following incident in his own words. It was a cold rain and I was desperately needing shelter, but I made a mistake. Instead of checking out the house, I knocked and saw a husky man coming to open it and realized he was probably one of those spirit soldiers. I got frightened and ran off in the darkness. He called, who's there? And I answered, never mind, I've lost my way. But he didn't let it go. He opened the door and let out a yell towards other houses with lights showing, candle lights. There's a stranger in the county, countryside and he's coming down your way. That was a heck of a note. I wasn't anticipating anything like that. So I crawled under an evergreen, soaked to the skin and shivering. After a cursory search, the men dispersed and things quieted down. I came out from under the tree and fell about 10 feet over a bank down into the mud. But I had to get out of the weather. I went back towards the house and found a small loft where the farmer stored grain, like a carport, where I could climb up into the storage bin, figuring they'd never dream that I would do such a bold thing. Now, drying out, I congratulated myself. And then a dumb dog in the house began to bark. <laughs> First, nothing happened. It kept on barking. The man talked to it and then threw open the door and the dog came right to where I'd shinnied up and wouldn't go away, looking up at me. <laughs> the man had a crude ladder and began climbing up. So I got to my feet and tried to walk on the rafters as I had done the night before, except there was a lamp in the house and I was in plain sight. People in the house began screaming, and guys from down the valley arrived with torches, and they cornered me. The farmer on the ladder had a cane and began beating my feet. Don't hit me, don't hit me, I'll come down. And I did. They took me into the house, five men wearing nothing but loincloths, and they did look impressive, sitting on the floor of the house in a circle with me in the middle. Now I was in big trouble. And hoping to set them up for something, I began groveling. They called me a robber, a bad robber, very suspicious of anyone traveling at night. I pretended to be weaker than I was and used a common Chinese proverb. What kind of men are you? Here I am, an innocent traveler, journeying through this country, starved and hungry, and you treat me like this? You have the bodies of men, but you don't have the hearts of men. I laid it on as thick as I could. They had no idea who I was and began talking among themselves, just as if I weren't there and couldn't understand them. You know how some people are with a foreigner? They had heard me talk in Chinese, but it didn't register with them. 
They thought I was a Ningpo Chinese, even though they didn't know what that was. A person from a city on the seacoast of China a thousand miles away. They decided either to kill me as a bad guy or wait to get a reading from one of their leaders and then kill me. Just a matter of when. To make a very long story short, they took me a little way down the hill to another house and someone to get a gun to finish it. Finish it. At that point, I pulled out my devotional book out of my shirt and said, look, see this book in here? I'm a Russian and just crossed the river Shintan yesterday. I'm on an important mission, and this book is a proof of it. Do anything you want me, but when the Russians come, they'll kill all of you. They half believed it, and half was enough to instill doubt, since they'd seen Russians with the Reds who had mounted big propaganda campaigns that they were here to help them. Kind of like the IRS, huh? They looked at me quite a while, so I told them I was a Russian spy in advance of the army. Well, they decided this was too much for them to handle. They'd get a higher up clan leader in the morning, and behold, they fed me a bowl of rice and a few vegetables for the first real food in 48 hours. I went to sleep on a mattress that must have had 20 bed bugs per square inch. <laughs> Amazingly, the next morning, Nobody came, and after a while, I simply tore a page out of the book and wrote in English. This man has assisted me and handed it to the man of the house. I had to go and walked out. He just stood at the door watching. Howard always admitted to his audiences, quote, I'm not proud of having deceived these boys, lied to them, but in this instance, my life hung on it. Day four, exhausted, desper desperately thirsty, Howard came to a water hole beside the trail where a lad's water buffalo was drinking. I'm interrupting because this is a, an actual band of Chinese and that picture came out of Life magazine in 1936. A missionary who found this picture in a house in uh, China, obviously, gave it to my dad who pointed to several men in it that he recognized. This was the commissar of Ho's army with whom he had a number of talks. There were two here were higher officers and only he would know that this was a woman in uniform and the wife of one of these two men. Those are the only images I have of any of the actual soldiers that were in Ho's army at the same time as my dad. A remarkable picture. It's translated, someone translated it for us, translated this up here and it describes how this group with others had uh, overcome a village in China. And I'll interrupt to go to the next one. Picture of a lad with a water buffalo. Not the same one, obviously. And Dad says, I threw myself down and drank from the same muddy pool, well aware of the danger of typhoid, the least of my problems. Moving on, lo and behold, he found a sandal. And later on, another one. I don't consider that a coincidence. Needing rest, he crawled in beside a roadside shrine. Well, probably like that, and said later, I knew if I had been found there, the people would have killed me on the spot, but he needed a place to rest. There's one other incident I'll share, which I never heard Dad tell in public. Since he was sen sensitive to those who are skeptical, that personal guardian angels exist. I am not skeptical. Back one day earlier, he had come to a fork with trails leading in 90 degree directions. He knew one would lead to a river he could follow downstream to a village, but he had no clue which path to take. 
Starting up one trail, he paused near the crest of the hillside to catch his breath and look back. Look back. A man, he assumed Chinese, was standing at, back at the fork, hailed him. He hadn't seen a soul all day before this fella. Where are you going? Why was he asking me, Howard thought. Finally, he said, Chitam, which he knew was from a friendly territory. The man stood in silence. You'll never get to Chitam that way. Was he trying to trap me? If he was telling the truth, I would never have the strength to retrace the direction I was on. Chitan is that way, pointing to the other trail. Howard looked at the mountain chain ahead of him and decided to believe him and began hobbling back down. He didn't want to go near that man at the fork, so he cut across to the other trail. As he started around the bend, the figure was still standing there. At that time, I was miles away from any habitation. If I had gone down that road, I was told later by missionaries Paul Bartell and Ed Truax, who was serving in the general area, that I was heading off into a wilderness where in my weakened condition, I would never have made it. I was miles from any habitation. By the middle of one more day, Dad stumbled into an encampment of warlord troops who after debating whether or not to sell him back to Ho, decided that was too risky, and they let him proceed under escort to Peng Shui, finally out of the immediate reach of the Reds. About a year later, on the famous Long March, Ho Long heard that a nearby sister Red Army, commanded by his brother-in-law, incidentally, had its own Westerner captive. Ho went to check him out. When he eyeballed Swiss missionary Ross Bosshart, and Bosshart told me this personally, Ho shook his head and said, no, it's not him. We had one, but he ran away. There were two other escape incidents, which if you want to hear me back, you'll have to invite me. Meanwhile, as resourceful as Howard proved to be, he never failed to credit God for his deliverance, and we can attest to that claiming Psalm 34, 6. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him. Now, four, four of Smiths in February 1935 remained in China serving out their seven-year term in Anhui province, and then returned to the United States on furlough in September 1937, concurrent with the outbreak of China's long war with China. Fast forward 42 years, I was privileged to represent the U.S. telephone industry in 1979 at the opening of the U.S. liaison office, shortly to become our embassy. A year later, as I mentioned earlier, I was invited by the Ministry of Telecommunications to organize and lead a delegation of U.S. technologists to give seminars to professional counterparts in China. And I had that interview with Madame Xu Meng, and later on, uh, a visit to her villa to meet her family, and then finally to uh, do a favor for one of her children. The regret is that uh, that uh, biography of Ho, if it had been factual, would have made fascinating reading, which only goes to prove that truth is always stranger than fiction. Thank you. What am I bid? <laughs> Adrian says we can take some questions, we'll try. And maybe I've answered most of your immediate ones. When was your first trip back to China? First trip back was in 1979. It would have been February, one of the first groups that was welcomed back to China after the Cultural Revolution. And we were. In all of our trips, we were warmly welcomed by our ambassadors. Uh, I don't know that they would do that now or have the time or inclination with the, how wide open the country is, but back then, groups like ours were 
uh, rather strange, and we were fortunate enough to be given receptions in our, our embassy quarters, meeting the various ambassadors. Is your book still in print? It is a self-printed book. I printed 350 copies, gave away to libraries in China hands. I never sold any. I have a few left. I put several in our library, and they were <laughs> I hope whoever has them enjoys them. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Are there any missionaries in China now? Not called missionaries. There are many, many uh, Westerners in China doing various types of, of teaching, uh, manning uh, nonprofits. Uh, Moyne Martindale from the college, for example, has had a number of trips to China where he taught and had uh, sessions of witnessing and ministering to Chinese, but the government would evict you immediately if they identified you as a missionary. In fact, it's very tough there now. We've had friends that have been a, given a week to pack up and leave, but they're still working and trying the best they can, those that have remained. What, what is the parents in the war years, say the war years? Uh, the war years being World War II, I assume. We were on furlough as the Sino-Japanese War started. We left, we did three years of basic deputation. Usually they're only a year, but because my dad's experience was so interesting at a time when, you know, uh, those kinds of stories were fascinating, especially to Christians. We stayed another two years. We were on our way back to China in September of 1940. He had been assigned to the uh, city of Wuhu on the Yangtze, which was occupied at the time by the Japanese. We got halfway to Honolulu, and the United States State Department alerted all uh, ships on the high seas that they could no longer protect their citizens beyond the open city of Shanghai. So to make another long story short, we got off in Honolulu to wait instructions from our mission board. Uh, none came, to make a long story short. It kind of felt that we put you on the boat, we don't want to see you for another seven years. Uh, so my dad took a pastorate uh, on one of the neighbor islands, and that's how I grew up in Hawaii. So you spent four years in Hawaii. That's correct. We were there for Pearl Harbor, and what uh, happened after that. I just have to ask you, have you ever seen the movie The End of the Sixth Happiness? Uh, the Inter yes, I've seen that and a number of other movies that uh, were well done about the war years in China. Yeah. I'm wondering, is, is the underground church still alive? Very much so. I was there just a month after the last Olympics <coughs> with a friend for three weeks. We were invited by two young nurses from Gonzaga University. They were there working in the local Well would be a, uh, we're going to have a great decisions uh, session in June uh, that I'm presumably going to moderate for, for it, and it will deal with China under our current premier there. And as we know by the media, uh, all religions are being tested very greatly. Uh, we'll, have no doubt that the underground church will survive, but they will survive as a uh, persecuted church to some degree now. Do you know Chinese? Ni hao. <laughs> I spoke Chinese as a child, and unfortunately, when, we were when I was brought back to the US, 
uh, and tried to be enrolled in school, you can say that I learned English very quickly. So no, I don't know Chinese. I'll tell you a funny story, though, and Adrian can call this truck. I determined after our first trip there in 79 and 80 that I was going to, uh, I regretted greatly not retaining my Chinese, but I was going to do something because we were guests everywhere as guests of, for a banquet. So uh, we had a professor at Wheaton, what's her name now, Chinese, that taught uh, mathematics. Uh, but I went to her house in Wheaton. I had written out what I wanted to say in response to the uh, greeting. Rose Wong? Yes. Wanted to speak. So we worked on my memorizing this in Chinese for a long time. I thought I had it down cold, really. On the plane all the way across to Shanghai, I would be memorizing and rehearsing this about one minute. You know, one minute a long time in a foreign language is challenging. Well, in Beijing, with a couple of hundred guests in our delegation, my host got up first, as he would, and welcomed us in Chinese, interpreted. So I get up and respond to him in my Chinese. Everybody claps. I sit down. He leans over to me and says, that was wonderful, but I didn't understand a word. <laughs> So that's my experience with that incident. All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Can we get a big round of applause for Ray? Yeah. Yeah.